Okay, great. So uh, I am going to switch over to screen share here and uh, I'm gonna talk about these best practices. This, um, I'll, I'll post the slides from this um, later. So the first is, is the use of assertions. So um, for those who haven't taken 470 or other classes which introduce these, um, assertions basically provide runtime checks. Excuse me, this is not showing. Um, oh, that turned off. Um, okay. So uh, they provide a way of checking at runtime that certain developer assumptions are, are indeed being held, uh, that are indeed being maintained. In other words, that what the developer assumes is the case is in fact the case. Um, and they're an aspect of what is called offensive programming, not in the sense of being obnoxious. You know, it's, it's not offensive in the sense that it's like in your face, you know, um, uh, throwing out profanities or something. It's it's in the sense that you're going out and you're you're on the offense. You're going out and finding the bugs. You're not letting them find you. Testing um, is a matter of them finding you by and large. Um, uh, use of assertions is a matter of you finding the bugs. Um, so um, we are not. I tested this earlier. Some, somehow it's not uh, connecting properly. So I may have to stop on the slides and restart it or just get, get this going. So you're finding these trials. You're not waiting for them to be recreated for you, you know, for you by uh, um, In that sense, it's, it shares a feature with pure release, which are about. Taking the battle to the enemy. It's about going and finding these things actively before they find you. Um, okay, so uh, with that said, with the uh, video uh, now working again, um, I'll go back into the slides. Uh, and there's many examples. These have changed over time, and these are actually some older examples which merit um, uh, being updated. But you know, if you're doing lower level systems. Programming. So, like, if something on C, you know, um, you can fill memory with, with values. If you're doing 332 type of work, if you're building a new page management system or something, you can, you know, fill memory with illegal values. So, if you have a loose pointer and you access it and you spot it, um, or fill an object with illegal data before you let it go, so you know that if you know, if you, if you use it, you know, oh, there's a mistake here. Um, this should be used. Um, if you use, uh, if you're using anonymous, um, folks are anonymous probably, you, you have an illegal one so that, you know, if it's not been initialized, you'll spot it immediately, et cetera. And the idea here is that, um, you know, in terms of the problem handling approaches, um, Assertions provide a way of spotting logic errors, development mistakes. <laughs> they are supported by many programming languages as a built in concept. In Java, for example, you have a, a search um, mechanism that can actually check these things. And uh, what varies um, is that in, in, in some parts of the industry, assertions are left in the shipping code and code that's in production. In other cases, people will take them out. Um, and there's some philosophical differences about these. But the basic gist is they're, make, they're doing sanity checks at runtime. So the, the developer has certain assumptions about what's going on right now. Like that this is a null pointer that's being passed to this function. Uh, excuse me, it's not a null pointer. Um, or that this array is of length greater than 10, or that the order of the elements in the array is sorted. In other words, it's ascending order. Then um, you, you check that at runtime. Um, there are times where that's expensive. Maybe you're checking that a brute force algorithm gives the same results as a, uh, a very clever algorithm. Um, but for, um, for debugging, uh, for testing, maybe you have that assertion in place. Um, uh, maybe you check that the array is in order during test development, but for runtime code, you eliminate it. 
so that it doesn't impose a performance cost. Um, this can be very helpful for spotting mistakes that would otherwise go on. And you know, there's a lot of mistakes that can be um, avoided in this regard. Uh, one of them is failure to adhere to contracts. I think you folks in the 370 or 270 will have all encountered the idea of code contracts. Like preconditions, post conditions, maybe invariance or history properties. Not as familiar, but preconditions, post conditions, like for a function. So the idea is, you know, you, you make sure that when it's invoked, for example, um, the assumptions in place about this argument being greater than zero or this argument being greater than that argument or this being a non empty dictionary are adhered to, right? Um, because the code counts on that for its logical correctness. And for post conditions, if the precondition is true, you guarantee the code should guarantee that this post condition is true. And those are like gold for assertions. And in fact, some they're so associated with runtime checking of these things that they're sometimes even termed by some assertions. But the point is, this is uh, these are a set of uh, explicit assumptions, part of the specification of what is done by this piece of code, like a function, or in the context of invariance and history properties, you can write contracts for classes. Um, and and then you test them at runtime. Um, so you might test properties of data structures, the eternal consistency of certain data structures or the algorithm. You check that the index is always increasing or that this accumulator is always rising or what have you. Um, and you know, here's a bunch of ideas. Bear in mind that some of them have performance costs. I said earlier, checking a brute force versus a clever algorithm. You may say, that's wild. Why would your code do that? Well, the point is, it does that during the testing. It does that during development to make sure that the clever algorithm is correct, that it gives the same answers as the brute force algorithm. And then once you're in production, having developed confidence it's working correctly, you don't do that. This is, this could have saved some teams in this class to make your group. There was a team some years back that had rugging algorithms uh, for public transit. And if they had done that, they would have found that they're really clever algorithm for, um, for routing of vehicles actually had a mistake in it. They could have tested it against a brute force version of it very easily, but they didn't because they wanted to be clever. They wanted to be quick. And the problem is it was quick and give wrong results sometimes, as I discovered test. Um, so uh, you know there's a lot of things you could check. And and assertions let you find a mistake close to its source. When we run when we run tests, we find often failures. They they occur, you know, that, that indicate uh, uh, a problem. But where they occur is often quite far from where the underlying faults occur that gave rise to it. All your follow-up failed test is, is an indication of a, of a failure of some sort to match, say, an expected value when you're running tests. Or if a user um, spots it, a manual tester spots it, it may be very far from where the real problem occurred. Maybe there was a you know an incorrect value computed by the system some time ago, stored in the database, and it only comes out later. With assertions, you, you litter them throughout the code. And that's what I expect from your project. I want to see assertions throughout your code. And anytime you're thinking about an assumption you're making as a developer, or as a tester, you're thinking about, you know, what's going on here with this code, or maybe you're in a, in a peer review of some code or in a formal inspection of some code, you can come up with assertions that will check those assumptions and you can put them into the uh, uh, into the code. Uh, so just be aware that assertions can go everywhere and should go everywhere. And the, the greater the density of them, the more of them that are in your code, the easier it will be to track down where the error came from because you spot it closer and closer to its source. 
it's less and less likely it will go some time before it's found. It will be found closer and closer where the issue came in. They're really good for working with tests. They're really good for working with peer reviews. And uh, they really help document our assumptions, the, the, the sort of um, the rules, the things we expect to be the case when you're reading code. So if the code has lots of assertions in it, you often understand that code better because you know basically what things are guaranteed to be true. And when you're reviewing that code, you have greater clarity too. So I want to see lots of assertions. Um, and um, you know, there's lots of opportunities also for, for tying them into logging uh, and, uh, and and logging the uh, the results of of the uh, the computations, etc. And if you have an assertion failure, the logs log can clue you into where the problem, you know, might have come from, et cetera. Um, and you can log the fact that an assertion failure occurred and what the assumption was that was being checked, et cetera. Um, so, um, so, you know, assertions are one of these best practices that are very widely used in industry and should be, I expect them in your code. There's no reason I shouldn't see lots of, uh, even when doing design documents, sometimes you're thinking about, oh, we don't need to do that because this is guaranteed. Well, document it and, and get it in assertions. Okay, I wanna talk about continuous integration and smoke tests. Um, have you folks encountered the term uh, smoke test before? Uh, okay. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about that. Um, okay, so continuous integration is a process. Uh, the, the impetus towards it first originated in like the early 1990s. I think it was uh, Gary Gooch that, that uh, first really proposed the widespread use of continuous integration. I was, I was actually on one of the very first teams that made use of an approximation for this. I was a software developer at Microsoft in the late 80s. And I was on the team that uh, was was developing Microsoft Excel at the time. So I contributed to Microsoft Excel, and we had what was called daily builds, then, which were kind of a, a '80s approximation to continuous integration. We didn't have the computational resources to do a build every time we checked in. Back, back then, it was CBS um, with the, the the code based management system, but instead we do it daily. Um, so every day to be a build uh, under Tidcom. Continuous integration takes that to the next level. And that originated in the early 90s, where basically when you push, you know, you commit, you uh, the various systems over the years, subversion, get CBS and so on, and handled it a little bit differently. But the idea is you kick off a build pipeline that runs uh, the compilation. But what else besides a compilation might be run in the context of a build? What else would you do besides compile the code? Anyone? Give me, give me some things you might want to do when you're, you've got to push to the repo and you've got some new code that's been incorporated. What else might you do besides compile it? Yeah. Uh, run test. Yeah, run test. Your name? Zach. Uh, Zach? Yeah. Okay. Um, that's exactly right. Run a bunch of tests. They could be unit tests. In some cases, they might be integration tests. At the least, as we'll see, you want to run what's called the smoke test. Now, a smoke test is different than these others. The smoke, the, the unit tests, the integration tests, the system tests. Um, I'm listing things of successive levels of, of kind of uh, expense. Those things are designed to try to ferret out new bugs, identify new, new defects, the signs of new defects. And then you have to go through a debugging process. A smoke test is designed to basically allow us to identify, is the system in a sane state? What do you mean? Is it like psychotic or something? No, it's not a matter of it being like, crazy um and it's going to go on rampage it's, it's an issue of it um is it in a state that is unstable 
to such a degree that we don't want developers to to abide by pull requests involving it. We don't want them to get the new code because it will so hose them that they won't be able to proceed with their development. We want to know if you're doing a check-in, are you basically breaking the system functionality so much that you need to roll it back? So it's not ready for prime time. It's not ready for, for you know, other people getting uh, getting on, on their side and pulling it down to, to, to their purpose. Um, smoke test is designed as a sanity check about and the, it, it answers the question, do you need to roll back the latest commit? It's not designed to ferret particular bugs out of you're not finding a specific one. You're just saying the system is so broken that this build needs to be discarded. The latest repo commit needs to be rolled back and it needs to be fixed. The person who checked it in needs to, they've broken the build is the term for it. They broke the build. They, they so, screwed thing, so screwed the system up that you need them to do more work. Um, now, there's good reasons for that. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a sign they've been irresponsible. They might have committed just after someone else committed. They hadn't gotten the latest version of that other person's commits. And their commit doesn't play nicely with the other person's commit that occurred just before. And things blow up. There's more conflicts and problems with it running. And the latest build has to be rolled back. And the developer who committed it needs to do a poll of the latest, the other changes and committed them. More commonly, it's, you know, someone is, um, hasn't done a recent poll, a recent enough poll. Um, and it isn't a race condition so much they didn't do it in the last hour. And they should. Uh, but um, smoke tests are, are commonly part of this. So testing is one thing. What's another thing that occurs as part of that? What, what's something else? Perhaps check the first trial yeah. consistency. Style checks um, are big thing. And, and there's a system like code style that will actually check many different languages for adhering to style conventions. You may think, like, why would you check style? Because it's through consistent style that teams communicate with each other. And if you have a half dozen different styles for writing code, um, and I could go in, go on about different ways of writing code in different styles, you're going to have, it's going to be harder for one person in the team to review code of another person. It's going to be harder to make the, you know, the code play together nicely. And so style checks are actually a really big, important thing. And they can, they can basically find problems that hide bugs. Huge pieces of code, you know, giant functions that need to be refactored. Um, really obscure code, code that's really hard to read and, and reason about. All these things are things you might check. So that's a great one. More sophisticated, yet yeah, there's, have you folks heard of the tool Sonar? No? Sonar is kind of emblematic. Okay, check out Sonar. Um, some of the previous 371 teams have used it. Um, basically, it does what's called static analysis, a fancy term. But basically, what it means is it analyzes the code without actually running it. But to, to find out, if, are there likely bugs in it? Is it possible that you know, you'll get an assignment of a string to something that actually needs a, you know, needs a numeric value by, based on how it's used in JavaScript? This is the bane of JavaScript developers. And it's one of the reasons we use things like TypeScript, right? It's, it's actually type. But um, you know, there's, there's many languages, and I think Sonar supports a couple dozen languages, I think it's around 20. And um, and it will check your code for possible you know, pointer exceptions, possible cases where you're you know you're dereferencing something that's been deallocated or something that you're um, it, it never never finishes or that it uh, that you're you're assigning something meaningless to something else. Um, similar code checks are used in a certain area that's actually related to Sid's question earlier about um, um, if, if anyone remembers what that is. Um, what, what sort of more specialized check might you have 
if you're dealing with web-based systems, for example, that take user input. It begins with an S, ends with a Y. Security issues. So I don't know if you folks know, but um, you know, if, if you're trying to write secure code, there's a set of requirements for your code that go beyond just writing correct logical code. You have to do things like you have, you have to um, work on it in a way that deals with malicious users, right? Who can inject who can inject SQL through clever use of you know entries. It can try to cause buffer overflow errors, etc. They they can they can manipulate try to manipulate the user interface to cause the injection of malicious code into your system that will then conduct database queries or do a complete database dump or whatever. It's a nasty world out there, and if you run web servers, you know you get hundreds of attacks against them every month and so on from people who amongst other things are trying you know to run scripts script kitties that run scripts against them to cause uh, cause problems and so they're security checking tools that will run your code and, and analyze are you sanitizing strings so the strings you're getting through your PHP form god forbid or you know um uh, your your code that's manipulating uh, a UI in C sharp or whatever. Are you are you checking that your string does not contain illegal values or that it's stripping out any SQL code, et cetera? That it's sanitizing the strings. These are common use. What's another thing you might check in a build pipeline? Well, there's so there's some further needs that might be involved in terms of uh, some some basic code metrics, sort of the number of lines of code, um, the uh, the number of functions that have been written. Sometimes those are recorded. There's logging type tools that actually will log information about the latest commit, which is very common. So if, if you want to log the commits and what's involved in them, what's changed, et cetera, that's another need. Often we have deployment, we have recreation of databases that's required because database schemas evolve. And just as the code evolves, the database schema evolves and you need to recreate the database on the new database schema. So repopulate it. There's things involved in deployment, for example, or deploying to test servers all of these might be folded into a build. And continuous integration systems will often um, include those. Um, there's a lot of advantages for continuous integration. Um, you spot issues sooner, you help people integrate their, their code. It allows you to identify the state of the project earlier um, and uh, it reduces needs for status support. You can get reports that the build broken um, uh, to what degree is it working. Uh, you can do lots of testing that develop confidence that the system is basically working well. So you have a, often a build script and then a build pipeline. Um, okay, um, there's many systems to do continuous integration. And broadly, you can say there's three large eras of continuous integration that people have identified. Um, the earliest era uh, often involved. Uh, Sort of simple uh, uh, CI systems, simple continuous integration systems. Uh, Jenkins. Has anyone heard of Jenkins or Hudson? Yeah, so Jenkins was a very early contributor in this space that got people really empowered with, with CI. Um, most recently, GitHub Actions. Has anyone used that? Uh, GitHub Actions? It's really a very clever system that allows you to sort of compose together. Uh, even third party contributed actions that you might want to build into your build pipeline and sort of put them together almost in Lego like fashion, stack them, et cetera. Um, uh, Travis CI um, uh, is another sort of second generation system that was um, that's still very popular and very popular for use with GitHub. And uh, many teams in 371 have made use of it. 
It's not quite as sophisticated as GitHub Actions, at least my, as, as my most recent knowledge of Travis CI, but it's uh, very powerful. And you can actually have GitHub work together with Travis CI or use GitHub Actions. Now, for all of these, you, you basically have to decide, do you want your builds, your compiles, your, your tests to run on the cloud, or do you want them to run on your own server, on, on a server that you have set up? The tech staff will set up a server for you folks for this class if you want to. But bear in mind that for some of these systems, including GitHub, you you have you can get free free use of up to a couple hundred hours, I think, of of build time that might be enough. Okay. Um so someone needs to maintain the build, and we're gonna have to finish up here. I spoke about the smoke test. And avoiding uh, building, uh, avoiding breaking the build. What's expected of you in this area? Well, there's a couple of things. One or more build masters. Um, I want a one step build. There, there needs to be, uh, you know, a one spot build that occurs that will build the entire system. It, it can't just be jiggery pokery by someone manually running this, manually running that. You need to use build pipelines and take the issue seriously. Okay. Um, uh, and you need people to push regularly. You need to avoid the big bang. The big bang is, you know, people hold off for a couple of weeks while they're working on their code. And the night before the incremental liberals is due, they push it. And it all also breaks loose. It just won't play together. You should be pushing at least every few days. If you're doing active development, and ideally many times a day. That's really the the spirit of get is to push very frequently so many times a day when you finish a logical chunk of work you've tested it you, you tested it against the latest version of the code base run the unit tests etc um document it you, you push it um and you should be doing polls basically at least it from other people's code ideally more and if you get poll requests you know you, you'll you'll do them based on those poll requests um and you know you should be testing it regularly against the latest version of the code base. Um, generally, you'll have different debug and release versions of things. Um, the debug will have assertions in it, um, and you should have several step uh, build pipelines associated with your thing, um, associated with your system. Um, and you should be posting and monitoring smoke test results and build build results. You should know, and everyone throughout your team should know how to check. If the latest build was successful, is the build broken? You need a mechanism of knowing if the build is broken and you built uh, you've broken it through your check in so you can roll things back. And you know, there should be some accountability for that. So the person who checks it in doesn't just go off scot free and everyone else, you know, has to scramble to fix it. The person who checks it in has to be the one who fixes it generally because they they're in the best position to fix whatever issue was come in. It may not be their fault. It may be that it was just a bomb race condition with someone else's check in, but they need to be involved in fixing it. Okay, so this is what's expected in CI. So we've spoken about CI and assertions, and I want to see them widely used in your projects. Okay, okay. Um, so that's all we have time for today. Um, uh, if you'd like to look at binary mini milestones, just be aware of what's required there. But the next time we're going to be talking about in more detail is testing. Okay. So I have office hours now. I welcome discussion with anyone in those office hours. I will have Zoom open. Good to see everyone online and in person. And let me know, send me mail when you've decided the projects um, that each team has selected. And it would also be helpful if you let me know who the project manager is, so I can expect to uh, to do it. Yeah, there are several that I said it isn't adequate um, what they did, and I told them you have to you have to modify it. And so, if possible, they'll get me some updated project proposals. Um, last I checked my mail, I haven't gotten them yet, but I will check again uh, today. And ideally, 
you know, I have one more to the public. Okay. So, but I, I can't guarantee it, and I wouldn't count on that. You know, if it's not there by like today or, or the latest tomorrow, I would figure it needs to be put there. Yeah. Okay. Good to see you folks uh, online. I will be back in about uh, five or ten minutes here for my office. Thanks. Take care of them.